I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another exciting edition of Happy Talks. I'm your host tonight. My name is Taki Grant. And for all those who don't know what Happy is about, Happy represents unity, unity within the community. Um, Happy started with the precedence of one of the most groundbreaking films there is, the Happy film. If you have not seen it, I recommend you go see it. Here's a copy of the DVD. Um, if you don't want to get the DVD, you want to wait. We have an exciting screening coming up, excuse me, on our Saturday, May 1st. Um, and those screeners are always followed by a dynamic panel discussion. Uh, we want to just welcome everyone here to um, another edition of Happy Talks, like we said earlier, excuse me. Tonight we have with us Dr. Malefe Sante. Uh, we're going to be talking about the transatlantic slave trade, fact or fiction, fiction, who are we? And it's so important that we have this discussion because there's a lot of conversations going on in the community about the origins of African Americans. Are we the indigenous people to this land? Do we come over on the slave ships? And, you know, a lot of that, you know, needs to be, the record needs to be set straight for those who think otherwise, who don't really truly understand who and what we are and where we come from, what our connection is to the continent. So we have a series of discussions that we're going to be talking about these topics. And tonight's going to set it off um, with, again, Dr. Malefa Asante, who's one of the foremost leading scholars on this subject matter. But before we get into that discussion, we want to talk about a couple things. Again, we talked about the screening. The tickets are available www.happyfilm.com. Get your tickets for the screenings of Saturdays, uh, May 1st. Also, if those who are not signed up for the newsletter, please sign up for the newsletter. Um, the newsletter is a powerful piece of information, updates the family on things that are going on within the community. Uh, furthermore, if you don't have, you're not subscribed to the channel, please take this moment and do so. Please also take this moment and share this video. Uh, we got to get the video out. We got more people in terms of let, just letting them see it. Um, if you, so if you're with us on Facebook or YouTube, you're not subscribed, subscribe. If you have not shared this video, please share it. So and without further ado, we're going to bring in Dr. Malefe Sante to talk about this very topic. Greetings, Dr. Sante. How are you doing, sir? Yo, Hotel. I'm excellent. Thank you very much. It's good to see you. Hotel. So this has been about maybe four months since we had you on the show, and we want to thank you for coming back to see us again. Thank you. Uh, it's always an honor to be in your presence. Thanks, thank, yeah, I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Okay. All right. So this subject matter here, and you and I talked on the phone a couple of times, and you were kind of surprised about some of the, the notions of Africans not coming from Africa in terms of the transatlantic slave trade not existing. So we want to get into that discussion somewhat in terms of like who, who are we as people? And I guess we can kind of start there as African Americans. Who are we? Right, right. Well, uh, we, we are, uh, as African Americans, we are uh, people that represent uh, hundreds of African ethnic groups who were uh, transported across the uh, ocean uh, to the Americas, uh, mainly from the uh, uh, 16th uh, and uh, 17th and 18th. Uh, and 19th centuries. Uh, we are um, a complex people. We are uh, a, an aggregation of uh, uh, people who represent the African continent from uh, Mauritania all the way to Angola uh, on the west side. And we are um, people who uh, carries with us uh, the traditions of the most ancient uh, uh, civilizations on the face of the earth. Uh, and we are genius people uh, with great nobility and with great uh, resilience and persistence. Right. So in terms of like major <clears throat> ethnic groups on the continent, um, what are the the connections in terms of you know, like Africans here? Like are the African-American populations more people from the Yoruba um, tribes or more Shante? Like who, who are we? Well, uh, actually, first of all, 
Uh, I, as an Afrocentrist, we don't use the word tribe because we say that that's what the Europeans have always used when they refer to a people that they consider to be less than. So no, uh, as nations or uh, ethnic groups, uh, uh, we are a representative of at least 250 different ethnic groups. Uh, and now it is understood by scientists uh, that perhaps the largest number of African-Americans trace their ancestry uh, actually back to Cameroon. This is through the DNA studies that they've done. That at least 15% of all African Americans have origins in Cameroon, among the uh, the Bamaleki and uh, the Duala people. Okay. Uh, so so you know, we, we always say Europe. We always say Yoruba, and Yoruba is uh, when I did my DNA study uh, on my paternal side, my Y chromosome goes back to Yoruba, uh, but um, uh, we say Yoruba mainly probably because we speak. English and many Yoruba speak English, and uh, and when people are speaking uh, the colonial French language or Portuguese, we don't tend to identify with those people because we probably think that, well, the, you know, our people were speaking English in Africa, so when they came over here, then you know they must have spoke English, and then the ones who still speak English in Africa, they must be where we came from. It's not like that. Um, uh, probably from the Cameroon region all the way to Congo. It's where the majority of African uh, uh, Americans uh, de uh, were derived. And that doesn't mean that we didn't have, for example, uh, people coming from Ga what is now Ghana, Senegal, Guinea, um, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, many of those places also contributed, but um, the great numbers of African people came from what they call Central uh, African region from, Cam from Cameroon, on the west side, from Cameroon probably down to the Congo. So, okay. so we, we would have um, uh, uh, people who uh, represent uh, those ethnic groups, the ethnic groups that are now probably in Gabon, um, uh, uh, the ones that uh, represent uh, even uh, as far down as Angola, the Angola people. In fact, the Angola people uh, gave a large population uh, to the to the Americas. But the largest population, uh, I think, probably will be from the the West Africa and Central African region, Central West African region. Not, not the interior of Central Africa, but the coastal areas, because these are the places, you know, when you visit, and I've been to these places where uh, Africans left, for example, in Benin, um, in Nigeria, uh, in uh, Ghana, uh, in, in, in um, uh, um, Cameroon, uh, the, the, perhaps one of the, worst examples of places where we embarked, uh, I, I, to call it embark is really not a good word, but uh, for forced onto ships was a place called Bimbia. And Bimbia is uh, far more um, dramatic to me than Goray Island, uh, than Elmina Castle, uh, than Cape Coast Castle, than Ouida, than uh, the, the places um, that we talk about in terms of um, even Calabar. I mean, it, it, because what happened in Bimbia was perhaps the largest so-called factory for Africans coming from the interior of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Africa to the coast. And it is even today it, they call them UNESCO, United Nations Heritage Site. But if you go there, you come back uh, also hearing in your ears, uh, it seems, the piercing groans of the African people, the thousands of African people who left the continent through Cameroon. And many of the Cameroonians don't even recognize it. 
In fact, I meet Cameroonians all the time who tell me, boy, you know more about Cameroon than we do. It's because people don't visit, you see? And then uh, we think that we are forgotten, uh, but the continental Africans have also forgotten. And, uh, or uh, let's put it this way, it's a memory that they do not necessarily want to uh, bring to the front and to the fore. So sometimes they, they this, is, this happens. And then there are other places that I've been to at Ivory Coast, for example, where the Africans do have rituals uh, of remembrance. Uh, they also have rituals of remembrance in, in Ghana, places where they celebrate the fact that uh, they're, uh, that people who descended uh, from their areas were taken uh, to America and that are now coming back. So as we come back, we have the rituals of remembrance and the rituals of return, you see. Right. right. So Bimian, um, this is the first time I'm hearing of this this particular foy. What country? Yeah, 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 should, yeah, should, yeah, people should, Bimbia, uh, uh, B-I-M-B-I-A, Bimbia. You can check it. Okay, what country is it in? Uh, it's in Cameroon. It's in Cameroon? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. All right. So we talked about like just thank you for that. Um, just making a correlation between the different ethnic groups and nations mm -hmm. uh, across the Atlantic. What about some of the cultural similarities, like linking the people together, like some of the things that we may do here that continental Africans have done and just kind of even though we got a, a whole ocean between us, what are the cultural similarities that we brought with us? Well, well, uh, always put it this way, uh, because sometimes we say transatlantic uh, slave trade, but the ocean never did anything to us. It was a European slave trade. So when it's a European slave trade, it didn't mean that when we cross from one place to the other, we forgot what we knew. I mean, there is what Wally Schwenker, the Nobel Prize winner for literature and one of the great uh, African uh, writers of all times, uh, says, and I really like that. He said that there should be no saline consciousness, no salt water consciousness. Uh, salt water meaning basically when we cross the salt water, something happened to us. We were different than where we were before. Well, something did happen to us over uh, the 400 years that we have been in the, in the Americas, in this part of the Americas. Uh, and what happened to us uh, during this period is that uh, basically, uh, the Africans who came from all these different regions of the continent, uh, we, uh, uh, we intermixed with each other. We mixed with each other. And so Yoruba mixed with uh, Asante, uh, Asante is mixed uh, with Fante, Fante mixed with Bamaleke, with Eve, with Ga, uh, with Hausa, with Fulani, with Puel, um, with uh, Congo, uh, Bakuba, uh, Baluba, we, we mix with all these people. And then we mix with Native Americans who were here, and we mix with Europeans, and we mix with Japanese, Chinese. We, 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 so we are a new ethnic African group. But what retains for us, what, what moves for us is not um, our hair texture or our complexion or um, our uh, um, uh, uh, if physical uh, looks, what retains for us are the deep uh, cultural contributions that our people retain even during the 246 years of enslavement. Th that is the incredible thing because you see um, what Africans had in common were things that had been developed for thousands of years. Whether you were uh, from uh, if what is now Guinea, or whether you were from Mali, uh, there were certain values. And I, I, I said this in one of my books, The African Pyramids of Knowledge, that um, you, can, you can identify them, the love of children. You, you can identify them, ancestral remembrance. Uh, I, I said that there was uh, for us this, uh, this notion of the burial of the dead instead of cremation, for example. Uh, this concept of the polyrhythmic nature of music, you see? Uh, and, and you can go on and think about this. The, the whole notion of the, 
the rhythmic qualities of language itself so that we are people of the word, of the spoken word. But that doesn't mean that we don't write because we did write. We were the first people to wrote, write. There are no people who wrote before the uh, ancient Kushite people and the ancient uh, Kemetic people in the Nile River, uh, Valley, river Valley, uh, the Happy River, as it was called, the Happy River. No, no, nobody wrote before those people. So, so writing is African, but speaking is African because the sacredness of the speech itself reflected something that was common to Africans all across the continent. We brought that with us. And that's why you can listen to an African person uh, from Brazil or an African person from Colombia, because Africans were brought to those places as well. In fact, uh, there are more Africans in Brazil than there are in the United States of America, you see? And, and there are 30% uh, of the people in Colombia are black or Africans, you see? So South America uh, and even Central America, I mean, Mexico was a, uh, Mexico uh, had a large influx of African people in Mexico. Mexico is, is, was a slave country, just like the United States, just like Brazil. But Mexico had a different policy, the policy of mestizo, this whole notion of the whitening of the race, you see, was very, very deep in the Mexican culture. But yet you can go to Mexico and still see the cultural traits and values that black people had, and particularly in terms of relationships, because that's where our culture, I think, uh, makes its biggest mark. I mean, people ask me sometimes, well, what about the economic traditions of Africans? The economic traditions of Africa, um, of African people, is just like they've always been. It's based on relationship. It's not based on uh, some inherent uh, price of a commodity. It's based on whether I like you or not. And, and that's, that's where bargaining comes in. That's why people have uh, uh, markets, public markets, where you can uh, bargain with each other. Now, we've taken on a lot of Western culture. And we, 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 we believe that there should be one price for, for anything, and, and we should go ahead and pay the price, and, you know, and, and that's it, and it's finished. No, that's not an African concept. Uh, they, because it's not an African concept, sometimes we, we get confused. But of course, having been here for as long as we have been here among Europeans, we have taken on certain values of the Europeans. And you I mean that's that's why African people tell you sometimes, you know, I'm I'm not from Af Africa. Uh, and, they, and it's not because they're thinking about looks and they're thinking about history and they're thinking about memory and they're thinking about the things that they have seen on TV. They're not thinking about their cultural expression. Brother told me the other day, he said, you know, man, uh, I'm, 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 I'm Native American. I said to, to him, I said, oh, so which Native American culture do you practice? Well, he couldn't think of one. I said, no, it's not, it's not that I'm not talking about biology here. I'm talking about what's your culture? We have the African culture. I can go right now to Mobile, Alabama. I live in Philadelphia. I can go to Mobile, Alabama and listen to music. It's the same music I can listen to in Lagos, Nigeria. It's the same music I can hear in the Congo. It's the same music I can hear in Cameroon and the and same music I hear in Ghana. It's the same. And I recognize that quality, that commonality. And you go to Rio, it's the same. In Salvador, it's the same. In Cuba, it's the same. In Haiti, it's the same. And it's different from what I would hear if I went to Thailand. And it's different than what I would hear if I went to Lithuania. Because I recognize I, there's something common in that culture. Even though the people say I, I'm not, they're expressing it all the time. They're doing it all the time. So yeah, you're an African. You're not African necessarily by how you look. You're an African by your culture. What do you practice? What music do you hear? What, what, what uh, language do you express? And language can be expressed even though the vocabulary items can be um, in a European language. This is what 
Sometimes people say to me, well, African-Americans have forgotten their language. No, we didn't forget our language. We forgot certain vocabulary items in our language, but our language is still African. I grew up in Georgia and growing up in Georgia, my mother never spoke English. She only spoke what we call Ebonics. And she spoke Ebonics, and she didn't have to have to, she didn't have to go to school and learn it. Then the community, that was it. That's the language I have. That's my culture. That's the most beautiful language I know. And any African anywhere in the world, in Africa, in, in Mexico, if you in uh, um, uh, Guadala Guadalajara, or uh, uh, Oaxaca, Oaxaca in, in Mexico, you can still hear the same quality of sound among the Afro-Mexicans that you can hear among the Afro-Colombians, the, the Af Africans in Brazil, and the Africans in the United States, and the Africans on the continent. That is our common culture. Not, not our common, not our common, not our common uh, ethnic identity, because our ethnic identities are numerous and they are mixed. And when you say ethnic identities, you're talking about your ancestors. I mean, so so when I lived in Zimbabwe, for example, when I lived in Zimbabwe and I went to deal with Zimbabweans, I knew that my ancestry goes back to Harriet Tubman. Well, they knew that their ancestors went to Nehanda and they recognized that, that but yet we have commonalities, even though our particular ethnic group has, we, we have our own iconic memories, you see, and our own uh, cultures. I'm sorry to go on so long about that, but that's just. <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you so much. You spoke a minute ago about Ebonics, and I, I kind of wanted to get into that a little bit because I've heard uh, rumors that Ebonics, there are links to the Ebonics in, in terms of the way of the speech and to the um, different African dialects or languages and so forth. But before you can before you answer that question and get into that, could you just for a brief moment explain to us what Ebonics is? Yeah, e Ebonics is a word, the word number one comes from ebony and from phonics. And a group of uh, African-American psychologists and speech uh, scholars uh, back in the 1970s, uh, came up with the term Ebonics to actually reflect what it was that we were speaking, but that what some people were calling poor English or bad English. And their argument was that we were not even trying to speak English. So how, if we're not trying to speak English, how can it be bad? We're not there. That You can, there, there is what may be called uh, uh, poor English. I mean, I collect, I correct a lot of papers from a lot of students who have uh, poor English, but uh, what we spoke was not poor English because um, it was not something that was, uh, that could be, uh, that we could say, we, I can correct this. It is what it was, you know? If you had, if you had asked me before, I might've could, but I'm tore up now. That's not English. That's not even a way of trying to say English. I'm not trying, you know, I'm, it is what, it, it's what, it's it's my it's my language it's my language it's the most beautiful fluid language I fixed to go is it's my language it's powerful and it and everybody knows what it means it's precise it's the most precise it's more precise for me than English you know um, the other day I was walking down the street somewhere and there was a homeless man who uh, said to the guy walking ahead of me you know he had his eye for, for some money. And the man looked at him and he said, got no money. And I asked myself, what does this word mean, got no money? And I said, it doesn't mean, you can't even translate it into English, like, I have no money. I mean, that's not, that's not what he said. He says, got no money. Like, what the, and, and got no money, it, it came to me that in our language, got no money the way he said it was that even if I had money, I'm not gonna give you any. That's a very precise understanding of the language, you see, which you can't necessarily get by saying, I do not have any money. No, 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 it is different. So our language is, um, is, uh, is created by virtue of all these ethnic communities of Africa 
coming together. And I think that if we gave America one thing, well, they, they say we gave America its music, but I think we gave it its, we gave it its best speech. Because can you imagine what it's like? I mean, look at this, uh, Brother Taiki. If you if you had a, a German, um, a German, a Swede, a Italian, a Polish person, and a, and a British person on the same plantation, and then you have you 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 have a Japanese overseer over these five different European ethnic groups, and they have to speak with each other, and then they have to speak with the Japanese overseer. That was a challenge to us as African people. When we were brought over here, the, the challenge was that you had, uh, you had the person uh, who, was, uh, who was Ga, uh, Eve, um, uh, Serer, uh, Yoruba, Hauser, all on the same plantation, and the overseer was a Scotch person, a Scotsman. And, and we had to speak to the Scotsman, but we got to speak with each other because our, because we're from the African continent doesn't mean our languages are the same. The vocabulary of our languages are different, even though the, 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 the sounds and the, the rules of the language are similar, you see? I mean, we, we elongate vowels when we intend to, uh, uh, so uh, show superlatives. That was a long train. You see, that's the elongation of the vowel. We do that, and that, we do that in the African language too. If we speak in the African language, we say the same thing. We, 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 this is why we say, we also uh, do what they call duplicative sounds, particularly when we want to really emphasize something, goody, goody. Bye bye. That that's African. That's not English. English they say goodbye. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So so what we have learned is that we have taken from all these other. We've taken from all that all we know in the African world, and we've combined it. And we that's why it's, we give it ebonics. You see, the Afro the Af the African Brazilian has done the same thing with Portuguese. The people who speak Spanish have done the same thing. They don't speak Castilian Spanish among the Afro-Colombians in Buenaventura, Colombia. They speak their own language, you see. But the vocabulary, the lexical items are the language of the colonial powers. And that's basically what happened with us with English. I mean, we got together with all these African languages and and the uh, the overseers speaking uh, English, and and we learn to put the English words or lexical items into our grammar, into our sounds, and so forth. So we don't say just Jesus; we say Jesus. You see, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's a whole thing. You can see it in hip hop. You can see it in blues, and you can see it in jazz. It's the same. It's the gospel. That's why we relate to it because, and we say it's, we used to say it's soul because that's what it is. It's cool. This was Yoruba expression. You see, to be cool. That's that's the concept. Anyway, let's. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no need to apologize. It's great information. So when we're speaking of languages, um, there's like the people on the coast of South Carolina, the Gullah Geechee people, they speak a, there's an interesting dialect there. Can, what are the roots of that language they speak or the dialect or the form of speech that they have? Well, well, well I think it's, it's similar, but here's the thing. Uh, that, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Gullah people actually it can trace their ancestry back to Sierra Leone. And in fact, there is a, a strong connection between uh, Sierra Leoneans now and uh, the Gala uh, people. And there, there have been uh, relationships uh, going uh, across the ocean uh, between them for at least the last 40 years. Uh, here, here the, the thing about the Gala uh, language or the Geechee language, because we just say in Georgia, we say Geechee because of the Ogeechee River, 
This is the name of the river. It was Ogeechee River, you see. Uh, but, uh, but there was also uh, this notion that the, the Gullah comes from Angola, the Gullah people, uh, the Angola people, you see. Uh, but the, the interesting thing about it is because uh, that community was perhaps more isolated because many of them lived on the, on the islands, the sea islands, off the coast of Savannah and that, that region and all up into South Carolina and Georgia along the coast and those islands, there, there was a population there that uh, basically uh, spoke with each other and they kept that language. And then of course, when they moved into the interior of Georgia and South Carolina, they brought that language with them. That, that it's a very, very powerful language. Um, it's, it's some, some of the um, expressions are so powerful that we don't even recognize them uh, anymore. Um, like, um, I'm just trying to think of one of the ones that, that someone says to you, Haskashtan. Haskashtan is a, is a Geechee expression. But the question is, uh, what color is the sky? That's what that means, Haskashtan. So some of the words may be what I call old English words, but they have been brought into, they were brought into the Geechee structure, the Gullah structure for a long time. And, 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 and the, the, but the people, the Gullah people, the rest of African Americans, they, 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 they're, they're us, they, that's our people. And, and, and we're them, you know, they, there's no difference in, in that regard. It's just that they have retained in those particular localities in South Carolina and Georgia, they've retained perhaps more of uh, the, uh, the basic Ebonics. Uh, there was a book um, by Lorenzo Turner that was written in the 1940s, uh, which is called um, Africanisms in, in the Gullah uh, a language or the Gullah dialect, I think he called it. Uh, and this, was, this book was, was very popular. He found over 3,000 expressions used by Africans that came directly from West Africa. And then we still use expressions. Sometimes I, I hear things that are just not true. Like some, somebody said the other day that the word okay came from some Latin something. No, no, no. It was, it was a word that was used by the, uh, by the Wolof people in Senegal. That's how it came into America, okay. But not only that, but then the word gooba for peanuts. It's an African word. All these, all these things, they come, the word ebony itself is an African word. All these words that were brought into this language shows me, uh, uh, show me that the, uh, that the African people uh, have had an incredible impact on the culture of America. If you took us out of the American equation, this would be a very dull country. To Absolutely. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yes, it definitely would be. Um, so you spoke about one of the you know, some it was a book that you written earlier, and I just want to just get a, a take this moment so you to talk about some of your literature and where people can go to find copies of your your book so they can support you. I thank you very much. I I, I have uh, I have written ninety four books, and I have. Um, um, uh, written four uh, books on Afrocentricity. Uh, one was called Afrocentricity. Um, uh, the, uh, it's actually that was the first one on Afrocentricity, written actually a long time ago, 1980. And then I wrote the Afrocentric Manifesto in 2007. In 1998, I wrote uh, the Afrocentric Idea. Then I wrote uh, Kemet, Afrocentricity and Knowledge. Uh, I wrote uh, The African Pyramid of Knowledge uh, recently, about three years ago. And uh, last year I wrote two books, an Afrocentric uh, Pan-African Vision and a book on Amamazama, the Ogunic Presence in Africology. And, um, and I am uh, just completed a new book uh, which is called uh, Humans Being Human. And um, then um, another book, uh, uh, which will be coming out soon, which is called uh, uh, The Gift of Inyanga, which is African wisdom. And 
Uh, so, so, so I'm writing every day. So that's the, that's the key. And I have um, uh, most of my the last seven or so books uh, have been read have been published by Universal Right. It's uh, if you go to UW uh, UWP, I think it's called University Right Press. Uh, you uh, publishes UWP. There's seven books: Revolutionary Pedagogy. Uh, was written uh, uh, and published by uh, UWP. Uh, UWP also published uh, the Precarious Center, uh, which uh, I think uh, came out uh, recently, and um, um, and the Radical Insurgencies. These 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 three books: uh, Revolutionary Pedagogy, Radical Insurgencies. Uh, and the precarious center are more in keeping with a, a sort of a radical uh, vision, political vision, uh, trying to point us to the direction where we are uh, centered in our own historical narratives and that our, um, uh, uh, that our memories uh, are memories that are based on us being in the middle of everything that we are, you see, other than being uh, people on the margins of any other culture. I mean, I, 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 I detest the notion that Africans have to be on the margins of any European nation. Why, why, why are we on the margins? We're the mothers and fathers of civilization. What, what are we talking about here? What's this story about? No, and the enslavement and the colonization of Africa these were accidents of history. They, that, that was not the historical record of the African people for thousands of years. I mean, look at this. For, for the first two-thirds of Homo sapiens, the first two-thirds of Homo sapiens' life on the earth was spent in Africa. And before 70,000 years ago, Everybody, all Homo sapiens were black. There were nobody but black people. It, it only happened seventy thousand years ago, maybe, and for the European, seven to ten thousand years ago, they start changing. But the, but the world was black. This is a black world. The origins of the world. Do you see the origins of Homo sapiens? And Homo, Homo sapiens, according to science, has been with us for about three hundred thousand years most of the time in Africa. So the Africans were the ones who gave us uh, the ability to cross rivers. They gave us uh, the, uh, the knowledge of what foods to eat that would uh, sustain you and what foods would kill you if you ate it. I mean, we, the Africans did all, they did all this basic work already. <laughs> you know the continent, because otherwise, right now, people be dying. They pick up a tomato. They didn't know whether it would kill you or not. You know what I'm saying? But we we worked all that out. That's what the two thirds of the time of Homo sapiens living on the continent of Africa did. And don't let people tell you that the African people uh, were not scientists and explore. We, we were the first scientists and explorers. What do you think hunters are? They they, they talk about people who were hunters. What does a hunter do? What does a hunter, what, what do you have to know to be a hunter? What do you have to uh, uh, remember? What do you have to mark and trace? I, I, you have to even tell what the weather is gonna be the, the next day. If you're a hunter, how do you tell what the clouds mean? This is all worked out by Africans before any other continent was ever people by homo sapiens. Wow. So basically, but, our basic truth. Wow, it's fascinating. But Dr. Sutton, we really want to make sure people got your information. Okay. Um, so, you. so so just look, tell them just to look up, just Google Maleficante Asante. And okay. please, when you Google my name, purchase a book and help us out. Absolutely. We're, we're talking right. we're <laughs> about props here on Happy Talks. We want to make sure that people are supporting the elders that come on this platform, supporting the scholars that come on this platform, supporting Hoppy. With that said, please like and share this video if you haven't done so already. Also, the Cash App is there, happyfilm.com.
you haven't got your tickets for the screening, next screening is Saturday, May 1st, 7 p.m., followed by the panel discussion. You mentioned a second ago, Dr. Santi, about Africans crossing rivers. Um, some of the, the thought process in terms of um, the European slave trade not taking place, and I can call the, tra the transatlantic slave trade anymore, the European slave trade taking place is that Africans crossed the continent and we were conquered here. We know that um, Dr. Ivan Vesodman wrote the book, they came before Columbus, but can you speak to the Africans crossing the Atlantic prior to Europeans coming into the picture? Yes, there were Africans who crossed the Atlantic. It had, had to be Africans who crossed the Atlantic before Europeans, thousands of years before the Europeans came into uh, to the to uh, <laughs> to uh, the uh, to actually into the world of uh, 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 seafaring. I mean, uh, that's if it were not for Africans, there would not be uh, African people in Australia now. They had to cross the ocean to get to Australia. They had to cross the ocean to get to New Guinea. They had to cross the ocean to get to uh, to America, to North America, and South America. Uh, the, the people that we call indigenous Native Americans uh, were also Africans. They, they came, they had to come from the African continent. There were no other Homo sapiens but Africans. So whether it was 14,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, uh, 5,000 years ago, this is still before the European slave trade. European slave trade, and put it always put it on Europeans because that's to be honest. Because otherwise, we're not we're dishonest when we say African slave trade. It was not African slave trade. It was not the um, Atlantic slave trade. It was a European slave trade. No other people thought of this. The ocean didn't think of this. This is why I say don't even talk about the Sahara slave trade. Because the Sahara, the Sahara never did anything to us. It was the Arab slave trade. You got to say it correctly because if you don't say it correctly, then you get African people confused. They think well, slavery just happened. It's just supposed to be no, no, no. People did this, and say who did it, and then we would be clear in our own heads. You see, right? That's one of my next questions. Actually, who are some of the major players? Well. In terms of the European slave trade, yes, sir. All right. Well, the the, the first one was Portugal, and uh, Portugal and and uh, Spain uh, were were the two earliest ones, and that was had a lot to do with uh, something that was called the uh, Asiento. The Asiento was given by the Pope to make sure that uh, European nations would not be fighting over the same territories in Africa. So, if you had an Asiento from the Catholic Church. That meant that you could uh, you could uh, 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 force uh, Africans from a particular region and not have to worry about the Dutch or anybody else coming in there trying to take your territory and uh, and and take the Africans from that territory because you had already taken those that place you see and you had got the asiento from the from the Pope so that's how they kept down the fighting between the European powers so occasionally they did break out in fights. Uh, between the Dutch and the Portuguese, and sometimes the French, but the people who um, were the big players uh, were uh, Portuguese, Spanish, uh, uh, French, uh, English, um, uh, and uh, and uh, Dutch. I uh, did I mention Dutch, and then the Swedes, and then uh, occasionally and Denmark. So you did have Scandinavians involved. This is why when we talk about Denmark VC, for example in South Carolina, Denmark Vesey had been enslaved by the Danish. So you, you, you got the Danes, you, you got the, uh, the, the British, uh, you got the Swedes, you got uh, uh, you, not so much the Germans at that point, but later on you got the Germans, particularly in the 19th century, doing very dangerous stuff uh, by killing 50,000 Herero people uh, in uh, Namibia in one day, gunned them down with the machine gun. So, so there, there, there have been some horrible things that Europe has done and Europe has never paid. They never paid a, a dime in reparations to these African nations. They stole the best of Africa. They destroyed the economies of Africa. The economies that if they had not been uh, entered, uh, um, uh, vain intervened uh, and uh, and corrupted, interrupted by Europe, 
uh, would, would still have been uh, tremendously successful, you see. But all the natural uh, factories and manufacturing and uh, systems and networks of trade and marketing that had already been set and established during the African medieval period, all of that was broken with the, uh, with the, the, the damning uh, attempt to rob the continent of its minerals and its people. That, that, that is the, that's the tragedy of, of Africa. And Africa, of course, uh, was shocked by this, stunned by it, because it, we, we, we couldn't figure that there were people like this. And that was, a, that was the amazing thing. I tell people that if you look at what happened and you read uh, King Leopold's ghost, uh, Bahasha, you, you will see that the, the, the incredible stuff that Europeans did. They killed over half of the people in Congo, cut their uh, hands off, cut their ears off if they did not go and tap rubber from rubber trees. So when you talk about Firestone and Goodyear, yeah, where do they get the rubber from? They don't grow rubber in North America. They got it from forcing African people on the continent to do it. And if they didn't do it, they would cut their hands off. So that's the, that, and we don't know this history. So that's why we act sometimes the way we do, because we, we, we like, oh no, it didn't never happen. You see, Europe, and they don't teach this to even their children. This is, people ask, why is there generations and generations of racism? Generations and generations of racism because nobody ever says, stop, wait a minute, what's this? I mean, George Floyd, the George Floyd trial is one of the first times the white people even look at this stuff. They act like it never happened. They, they lynched, think of this, George Floyd murder. We, 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 we are horrified by it. I'm telling you, they lynched over 5,000 people in this country, hung us on trees and had parties and celebrations and festivals and brought their children to watch the death of a white man or woman. What kind of people are that? And then they don't teach you. Then the children act like it never happened. We didn't do that because it's not in the books, you see. But we got to put it in the book because we have to teach our people, our children need to know. If they don't if they don't know, they continue to make mistakes. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So you, you, you talked, you mentioned a minute ago about Goodyear and uh, so the tire company. So in terms of like corporations that we may know of today, people that were benefiting from this um, atrocities, like who are some of those other players in, in like terms of from a corporate structure? Well. Oh, actually, the major, what has happened, the major uh, corporate uh, structures, uh, corporate uh, corporations and companies that were involved, for example, in the slave trade, many of them have been purchased now by larger uh, con uh, uh, conglomerates. So they're, they're huge organizations. But I guarantee you this, most of the insurance companies, I mean, most people talk about Aetna, you know, being involved in but but no, most of the old insurance companies were involved. That's how insurance got started, the slave trade. That, that's what started the insurance. People were taking African cargo. We were, we were cargo, like cargo, commodities, people. And, and they wanted to ensure that if we got 800 black people, I mean, this storm, hurricane comes up on the sea and they, the ship is wiped out and we, they, they lost money. The, somebody got to insure this. That's how they started their insurance companies. That's the basis of shipping companies. Many of the shipping companies started during this period. And this is before Britain became a shipping power. It became a shipping power uh, around the, uh, in the 19th century. Uh, but it, at the same time, it had also become a big shipbuilding industry, you see? The same is true with the, with the, with the people, the Dutch. The Dutch is, Holland is a small country. Netherlands is a small country. How did it become so powerful during the slave trade? They built ships and they built sails and they sold them to the world. And all these ships had to have 
the, the, the imprimatur of being made in Holland and Dutch, you see. So all the shipping companies, the old shipping companies, the old insurance companies, um, uh, the companies that were uh, responsible for uh, uh, are, are building construction, old construction companies. They built the fortresses and they built the slave factories and so on. And um, this is the, the, whole, the whole, actually the best way to look at it is that, uh, and there's some European writers, Blout, for example, J.M. Blout wrote about this. And Africans, I've written about it in my book, uh, uh, the History of Africa, uh, as well as the African-American People, uh, two books I've written on these kinds of subjects. The, the, the whole economy of the West is based on the enslavement of Africans. The two fundamental problems with the establishment of the United States, one was the genocide of the indigenous people, and the second one, was the uh, enslavement of Africans. This, this, is, this is a big, and the enslavement of Africans brought them so much wealth, tremendous wealth, where it robbed us of our personal wealth because we didn't even own our own bodies, if you can think of that. We didn't own our own leisure time. We didn't own anything about that. And on the continent, our, our kingdoms and empires we're, we're in, always in turbulence because of warfare over the slave trade. Many African kings fought against um, the, uh, the enslavers. And sometimes people say, well, did they fight the diamond? Yeah, of course they did. But of course, a spear is, is not much against a gun. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it doesn't mean, so the, you know, the brothers and sisters had courage, but you, you need a little bit more than courage. I mean, and and Europe had the technical advantage, and that technical advantage was a gun. That was the only advantage. They certainly not smarter than Africans, and they certainly didn't have more courage than Africans. What they had was an incredible technical advantage that had not come to all Europeans. All Europeans didn't invent guns. It was only certain people who, who had uh, invented the gun, and the gun was interesting. Because uh, this this uh, this ability uh, uh, had been with the uh, Chinese, but uh, the Europeans created the gun before they did. See, but the Chinese just had fireworks for celebration and that kind of stuff. So it was a whole different kind of thing. And, and as far as Africans were concerned, um, our greatest armies. I mean, whether you go all the way back to Thutmose's. Uh, the third, who was the greatest military leader the world has ever known, or Ramses the second, who probably uh, would 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 be up there close to Thutmosis, and um, or Shaka, um, you know, uh, uh, you know the the you you had courageous, brilliant strategists and generals, and what Europe Europe is very smart at they put forward their mediocre people and they tell you they're great and we believe it. This is the, I have never understood this. I have never understood how, so take for example, I'll give you one example, then we, I, I'll be finished. You, and I saw this the other day because I was looking at the documentary on Alexander. Alexander the Macedonian, they considered the, like the greatest military general. This man led seven major military campaigns. Seven major military campaigns. Thought Moses III led 17 military campaigns. That's where the, that's where the king goes in front in his battle and he battles other people. Thought Moses III, 17 campaigns and came back alive. Alexander, seven campaigns. Now, of course, he was killed in the seventh, but he, he, but he did seven. And why? We, we, we don't know Thutmosis, but we know, we know Alexander because Thutmosis was a black man. You know, you know, you know, black, this black king 
who led this powerful army out of the, you know, coming with this great power. So we, and we have all over the continent, there are people like this and have been. In every, almost every region of Africa, you can find a, a great king, a great prophet, a great prophetess. The problem is we don't know. We don't know. And then well, we don't know. We assume, because the white man certainly ain't gonna tell you, you we assume, oh, who is this? So that's why I always tell people, go study yourself. And I tell, I have to tell continentals that. People from the continent, brothers and sisters from the continent, I say, hey, wait a minute, where are you from? And then you find out where they're from. Well, say, who is your greatest poet? And they say, oh, uh, uh, uh. They can't take it from nobody but Shakespeare. Oh, man, <laughs> come on, man, come on. Go ask your grand, ask your grandmama, ask your grandfather. Who are the people who create? Because in every society, anywhere in the world, you have the same uh, distribution of intelligence and knowledge. Okay, thank you so much, my brother. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Before, thank I have you. One more question. You mentioned the Haciendo. Yes, sir. I just sir. wanted to get into that um, briefly. Um, in terms yeah. of documentation, was could you just elaborate on the Asiento a little bit? Well, the, the Asiento, A S uh, I E N T O, I think it's spelled. Uh, the Asiento was uh, um, um, where where you went to the Pope, and you uh, as a, as a as a person who was going to explore or you want to be trading, uh, you went to the Pope and you asked the Pope, could uh, he give you an Asiento, and you had to pay for it. And you paid a certain amount of money, and and that allowed you to bring a certain amount of Africans uh, from a particular region in Africa. And if you had that asiento, if another ship came into that area and said they want to uh, take Africans from there, uh, you would say no. But here's my asiento. I have it from the Pope. You have to go get one and go to another area. But this is the area that I'm working with. And these are documented records. Oh well, yes, sir. I mean, they are all documented. Again, people, as I say, one of the, one of the books that people ought to read is the. Uh, I mean, uh, one of my books is called "The History of Africa." The okay. History of Africa. And right. one of the books you were in, "History of Africa." Yeah, that's that's one of that's uh, it's in its third edition. Okay. The History of Africa. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. We, we enjoyed you. Take care. Right. Enjoyed you. All right. Peace. All right. Peace. My pleasure. So, family, <laughs> that was another exciting edition of Happy Talks. Um, the elder said it himself. We don't know, and that's what Happy Talks is about: for us to know and to learn, to hear from, if you will, the, the mouth of the experts, bringing experts to the people. This whole notion about us not coming over in slave ships. You know, it's it's BS, and we just heard it from again one of the top top most leading scholars talking about it. Um, this Asiento is really interesting because it gives records and proof of evidence of these things occurring. Um, with that said, I want to thank everyone for all the nice comments and everything. Everyone was saying all the support that we have out here. Shout out to King Simon, Michelle Drew, DM. Um, it's been so many people. I just don't want to forget anybody's name. Dr. I, I saw, in the, saw in the comment section a few times, John Henry Staples, Donnie Williams, all those, the happy family, excuse me, the happy movement, supported, everyone supporting the happy movement, Black Silk Yoga, shout out to them. They're part of the partner us with now within our newsletter. For those who are not signed up and subscribed to the newsletter, please do so. Go to the website, www.happyfilm.com, and you'll see the section there and sign up for the newsletter. Please do so. And for those who have not seen Happy, a lot of the things the elder was talking about, the, the great Dr. Malefe Sante was talking about here in this discussion is in Happy. We talk about Thutmose the third. We talk about the European slave trade being the economic foundation for Western civilization. We speak about it from the economic standpoint, people understanding how this country was form, form, formed and founded on the backs of Africans. Please, if you haven't done so, you want to see Happy. If you want to wait to Saturday, May 1st, you can go to the website, you can get your copy of the film, you can get a DVD or a digital download. Any, either way, get a copy of this. Those who also want to find other ways to support Happy, 
is one of our happy t-shirts. You can go to the website, get this as well. The Cash App. Shout out to everyone. Shout out to the co-host Felicia Harden. Everyone in the chat. Again, like, subscribe this video. Um, definitely want to do that before you go. You definitely want to share this as well. Just want to say shout out to everyone again for the support and love. And we talk to you soon. Peace. I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority. Honestly, who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community?